Okay, welcome everyone to uh, the NASA Alumni League first Thursday meeting. Today is November 3rd, 2022, my wife's birthday. Uh, so I'm Stokes McMillan. Uh, and today our speaker is Dr. Douglas Terrier. And let me, uh, uh, hopefully we've got all this on Zoom and we got 20, 25 or so here. Uh, but let me tell you about Dr. Terrier. He's, uh, he serves as the Associate Director for Vision and Strategy at JSC. And he's a senior leader in the Center Director's Office. In this role, he is responsible for leading the strategy, creation, integration, and overall execution of JSC's ongoing transformation initiatives, revolutionizing the center's policies, plans, and processes around workforce facilities and products to advance human spaceflight. He serves as the overall change advocate and decision maker for the major center transformation goals and ensures that both horizontal and vertical coordination and alignment with the agency and across center organizations. Prior to his current position, Douglas was NASA's chief technologist serving as the principal advisor to the NASA Administrator on Technology Policy and Investment Strategy. And he was the advocate for technology with Congress, the, the White House, industry, academia, and other federal agencies. He previously served as JSC's chief technologist. Uh, Douglas also served as the deputy director of JSC's Strategic Opportunity and Partnership Development Office as well as Associate Director of Engineering. So Dr. Terrier has worked in the commercial aerospace factor, uh, sector for a total of 23 years with Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, and General Electric Aircraft Engines. He earned a PhD in aerospace engineering and a master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and he was awarded an honorary doctor degree from the University of Warwick in England for his work in organizational strategy. He holds patents for his work in aerospace propulsion and has published numeral, numerous technical papers. And so now let me introduce Dr. Douglas Terrier. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. And um, thank you for being here. I'm, I, maybe you can mute yours too, Scott. Um, can you guys hear me all right without the microphone? Because we got too many things going on. So first of all, let me just tell you, it's, it's really an honor for me to be here. Um, a lot of you guys, you want to do this? You're, you can mute your computer. I am muted. Oh, your speaker? Your speaker. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> So I just, before I start, I just want to say it's really an honor for me to be here. Um, uh, you guys are my heroes, right? So I actually recognize some of you. So I know it's not too long before I'm on the other side of the mic. So <laughs> but, um, but I wanted to start by telling you a little about me and why this is so important to me, because I know I haven't met everybody in the room. But um, sincerely, I want to tell you um, from a personal standpoint how much I know the center, the space agency, the NASA, the nation is really indebted for the work you, you find people did. And, and I couldn't be more proud to be trying to carry on your legacy. So uh, I hope we're doing a good job and I would appreciate your feedback. I know Vanessa really want is, um, I've been really impressed coming back from headquarters after five years, you know, to see the energy that's in the, in the community right now is really, really impressive. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Before I begin, I want to tell you why this is so important to me. And some of you may know me from before, you may know my story, but um, I was actually, I'm a first generation American. I was born on the island of Jamaica in one of these little mining villages out in the middle of nowhere, like in the 60s, literally, no running water, no plumbing, no electricity, certainly no television. And it was a real tough time. It was right after the missile crisis in Cuba, the Soviets were kind of spreading their wings across the Caribbean, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Cuba certainly fell, and Jamaica was right in line. And uh, it was a difficult time. I grew up with um, political violence, lost a number of my family members, and so on, the militia and that kind of thing. So. It's, it's not a, when I talk about some of these things, it's not some kind of esoteric thing in my head. It's a real experience. We were really in a position, like I guess a lot of kids are in the US today, where you hear all this nonsense, either the climate's gonna kill you or this is gonna kill you or something. Not a lot to be excited about. And we, thank God, we had this amazing woman, one room schoolhouse, 
you know, literally no electricity, no running water, no indoor plumbing. Um, got a little house on the prairie, school house, no windows. And this amazing woman, this is Iris Simpson, had the presence of mind to sit there and read to one to, you know, third world kids in a, in a village in Ireland. She got the local newspaper and it had the Reuters feed of the calm from Apollo to Mission Control in some far off place called Houston. And she read that thing to us every day. And in that man, I mean, in an instant, my brain was like transported from this, you know, dismal, um, very, 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 very sad environment into like, if these guys can do that, anything's possible. Anything's possible. Thank you. Get so you can hear them online. All right. Yeah. The, and uh, and I, I can't explain. It's it's very hard for me to not get choked up to say that my life changed in that moment because of what those guys did. Um, and I think it's important to remember that that's what this is about, right? So it's about exploration, it's about space flight, but we all know Kennedy wanted to kind of send a message to the world. And, and I knew in that moment that, hey, whatever it took, I was gonna get out of that place, I was gonna go to college, go to, go to Texas, get my, get my engineering degree and figure out how to be part of this team. So, and I also knew something else, which at eight years old, you don't think about, but those American guys are pretty damn cool. I wanna be on that team. So that had an effect that I didn't even the process is much later, right? That's the power that this agency has. So it is a huge thing. And I think a lot of our younger folks, especially um, misunderstand it. I think the folks who were in that, in that Cold War era really understood. And I spent most of my career, as you said, in industry and in the DOD world, you know, in, in skunk works and so on. So I was very conscious of what we're trying to do. Um, NASA has been amazing and continues to be. So I want to talk today real quick and I'll, I'll be brief on this stuff. You guys may have heard some of this. But I'll, I'll touch on the moon to Mars things. I think everybody in here is kind of familiar with what the agency is saying our current status is. I think we've kind of landed on, after going back and forth with administrations, moon, Mars, asteroids, God knows what we're doing today. I think we've kind of landed on a coherent plan that says, hey, here's a stepwise way we're going to go about this thing and, and move the ball forward. And I think it makes sense. Uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and working with the folks at headquarters. But I want to tell you about that a little bit. I won't spend too much time on that because I'm pretty sure we're all kind of in, in aware of that. And then I want to tell you about what JSC's role in that is. And the bottom line is Vanessa, myself, then Skerna, the, the whole leadership team and the whole, the, the, you know, the whole staff, we're focused on one thing. When, I, when Mrs. Simpson read from that thing, it said, Neil said, Houston, Tranquility Base, the Eagle has landed. Houston was the first word that's transmitted from another planet. We're focused on ensuring that the next time humans are on the moon, on Mars, and I don't care if it's Elon, I don't care who it is, that Houston's in, in the mix, that we're actually enabling and being a catalyst and an absolutely essential part of, of enabling the United States to be successful in leading that. So that's it. That's what we mean by the hub of Houston space. That's the mission, right? Um, it turns out that's in getting more increasingly difficult, which I don't have to tell you guys. It, it, it's, it's always been technically difficult. But I'll talk about that, the way the mission and the, the kind of strategic objectives are changing on us. And the, the ball's moving, but we're trying to put together a 10-year roadmap to ensure that we can continue to evolve and be successful in that. Now we'll go through this quickly. And like I said, stop me if there are questions, but maybe we'll have time to chat a little bit at the end, which I think would be a lot more, certainly more fun for me to hear from you all. So I wanted to just start out at the very top level. So I spent a lot of time at headquarters with the, the policy folks and so on, and I used to I honestly used to think like many of our for hardcore engineers that that was a bunch of politics that I didn't want anything to do with. It was kind of felt like it wasn't very relevant, but I learned a lot being there. I learned a lot about what really makes this this whole machine tick. So I wanted to, and, and as I said, many of you folks have been through iterations of this. I'm oversimplifying by just making the point that we tend to focus down here on what, what the organization doing is doing down at the bottom, what the architecture is, what the missions, we, we're focused on the technical stuff, but it really starts top down. And it's, 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 wor it's worth repeating that NASA is the only agency that reports to the president directly without reporting to a cabinet secretary. That's really, I, so I work for the administrator. I work for Bridenstine and I work for, for um, Charlie before him. And I was really impressed with the fact that my boss works for the president. The vice president was over there in the building every day talking, like not every day, at least couple, one couple times a month talking to him directly. No secretary of transportation, no secretary of defense. It, you, that's who you work for. But it also becomes very clear to you that it, NASA is an instrument of policy of the sitting president of the, of the executive branch. It is, whether we like it or not, right? And I think we all knew that was the deal. So if you look at, hey, that, that Cold War, what started us out, that, that 
what can he want to do is to show the Russians who's boss, show people like me in the Caribbean and Latin America, the U.S. is the big dog. And he did. We did that. This, this team did that in an amazing, unbelievably successful way that has been tra transformative to my life and millions of people, not just in the United States. And, and make no mistake, it's been transformative to the kind of geopolitical th in our hemisphere. But we chose an architecture that was optimized to get us there first. Cost wasn't necessarily a driving thing, reusability, that was not the thing. How can we get there before the end of the decade? It really drove the architecture decisions. The Saturn V Apollo vehicle was the exact vehicle for that mission. And we as JSC developed, I think, an ethos and a kind of- Click that hide button on the C hide. I don't, that one? Yeah, uh-huh, click that. All right. Here. So we, we, whether we meant, whether we consciously did or not, this organization optimized itself around that goal. And then if you go one step, maybe in the next iteration, when we got through that, we were successful. The next administration comes along and says, hey, you know those guys you were supposed to be showing up and beating in the Cold War? Never mind that. We're, we're trying to be friends now. Let's figure out how to do that. Let's figure out a, an architecture which, which we can do that. And some folks found that a pretty tough transition, frankly, right? Uh, because we were going to go make them be successful, really and share, and that was tough. But that again, from the White House policy standpoint, it was the, the thing was how do we reach out and create a collaborative environment with the, with the former Soviets? And, and, and we, this most, when I say we, JSC led the way, figured out how to build us into, you know, guys in rest and started, and then we went through all those iterations, as you know, but the station is arch, an architecture that is a plug and play modular thing where a bunch of people can hook onto it. It's designed not to be monolithic, but to be, uh, you know, assembly of, of com components from big and small um, partners. And we in JSC, which is remarkable, if you think about it, a bunch of engineers who used to, you know, be good at, at mission control and flight ops and stuff, figured out how to do international partnerships and diplomacy. And it's a really remarkable transition, if you think about it as an organization. And we kind of did that without really talking about it, right? Um, so we're here, what, all that to say, we're on the cusp, I mean, literally like we're at an inflection point where this game is changing big, like huge, because of all the private sector stuff, all the, you know, number of countries and private sector companies and the amount of private sector money coming into it. So I wanna talk about that today and what we're doing to ensure that we make this transition successfully. I won't read through all this. We, if you if you have a chance to look online, the agency just came out with its moon, moon to Mars tenants and kind of, you know, kind of goals, but there, there are things we'd expect that you, Many of the things I just said, and these are coming from the White House. Pam Melroy is working directly with the White House when she's talking about international collaboration, industry collaborations. You know, then we get into the crew time and crew return stuff, which are more technical stuff. But you'll see there's a lot of things on here, um, you know, developing the last one, commerce and space development, fostering the development of a, of a space economy. These are agents. These are not agency policy things. These are administration policy things. And they're pretty consistent across administrations, by the way. So we're being asked, you know, first go, go beat them, go figure out how to make an international team. Now go figure out how to build a space economy and design an architecture that lets us do that. So it's, it's a little bit more, it's getting, the dimensions of the problem getting more complicated. Good news is right now today, JSC is right in the heart of this. We are, we are in the middle. I think we have, you know, it, there, are, there may be smaller blocks of programs, but we have more pieces of this puzzle than we've, we have more things going on than we ever have, right? Um, if you look at the org chart, you, you'll see that, you know, we got Vanessa and the leadership and then we've got the programs under it. There's like a dozen people under there now, you know, so we've got station, you've got commercial Leo, um, obviously the, the Orion folks, the gateway folks, um, the, the clips and, and lunar stuff, the, the space flight research program, the, the new suits and EVA. I mean, there's a ton of programs. So we've got a big section of this. And that's good. And we're doing really good. And we're executing on the current mission, which will get us obviously Artemis one, hopefully get that off um, next week or two, and then uh, then two and, and, and proceed to the landing. Again, as you all know, it is different because this is about building a permanent presence on the moon, utilizing research on the moon. We've learned for 20 years how to live and work in space. That takes care of the transit part. If you're going to go to Mars or anywhere else, we have not done is the work of how do we live off the land on the surface where you can't take everything you need for two years. The moon's a proving ground. We really are trying to set up a sustainable presence. And I, you know, when I talk to lay audiences, I always tell them, it's like, you, the, the Apollo thing is like, you took, you took a camping trip and you packed everything you needed you, you, for three days and you get back, right? 
that's not what it's about. It's about learning how to get out there and live off the land and, and have a sustainable presence and maybe even provide the opportunity to build um, commercial opportunities for business, whether they're providing fuel or providing resources or whatever, you know. And I, I always say it's like um, if you're going to pack up your wagon in Virginia and try to go to California, it ends up you don't really do that. You actually go to St. Louis and stop and reprovision and somebody figures out there's a business there and sets up a general store pretty sure it's soon to army sets shows up at the fort to guard it you know and that's kind of not unlike the conversations we're having with space force and in the meantime we're developing this commercial economy around what we're doing and, and a focus focusing primarily on low earth orbit and if you think about it as sort of like you know distance from the earth right aviation has been commercialized low earth orbit's being commercialized we're focused on lunar and then on to Mars, and we expect that commercial wave to follow behind us. So we're trying to de design, by design, have architectures that enable the success. So the question is, what are we doing at JSC to transform ourselves to be very relevant to that? So we've started, um, you know, with what I'm by that I mean the 12,000 direct employees, but the entire community around JSC. And when we talk about the hub of human spaceflight, we're talking about all our support contractors. We're talking about Axiom and SpaceX and the, I'm sorry, well, SpaceX, Blue Origin. We're talking about um, intuitive machines. We're talking about the growing space economy in this region. We want it to be the hub of human spaceflight. So Mark actually kicked off, Gar kicked off this Their Unite Explore initiative, which is kind of the, the theme of, you know, how we're going to transform JSC to that, that third kind of 3.0 version of the of the, the center and our identity and our our um, really our culture to meet this challenge and those teams worked pretty hard over the last couple of years came up looking at where we were we kind of picked the things that we know we have to go get really or continue to be good at leading globally you know leading the growing international community exploring new destinations so that we have we're driving the the exploration revolutionizing the human experience in space is that's around that we're the ones developing new technology and, and driving, um, you know, the leading edge of that technology for space exploration. The create gen game changers teams were all about how we create the right kind of workforce to be available to, to really respond to that environment. And the propeller space economy is about exactly what it sounds. It's not just about executing our missions, but really being a catalyst for the growth of the entire economy around us. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So Vanessa asked me to come down in December. It's been a year to see how we can um, you know, really put, kick this thing into high gear. We've, we've put some initiatives in place based on those five kind of key initi key themes. Uh, we got some of those, those are on, on the way and running and doing well. But um, when I came on board, I said, well, wait a minute, we've got, um, we, we know what we know from where we sit, but there's a whole market out there that's changing pretty fast and we might need to take a step back. So we went through this process and I won't spend too much time on this waterfall, but what it says is if you're doing if you're in any kind of marketplace, the first thing you got to do is figure out, you know, you can figure out, you can talk about what you want to sell. You can sell what you're selling, or you can stop for a minute and ask them what they're buying. And that's a really fundamental thing I learned at Lockheed in an international business. Well, kind of important to ask that question before you start making plans. So we stopped and said, Let, let's hold on a minute. Let's start from, let's pretend we just literally showed up, don't know much. Um, we got some people to come in, some consultant stuff. And we said, let's look at what the space market looks like in the future and and we mean the commercial civilian the economic and strategic aspects of that our our friends in uh space force um you know the strategic side the intel side what does that marketplace look like um given what that is and can we describe what the needs in one five years what's that how's that gonna evolve and then can we decide what are the customers stakeholders whatever you want to call it because unlike what we've seen in the last most of our career where pretty much our stakeholder is heel and we respond to HEO as JSC. That is no longer going to be the case. We are, you know, just like we were NASA versus the Soviets. Now we're HEO, which is a 50 nation consortium on station. This is about to get to be a really big consortium of nations and private public sector partnership. And the government that the White House expects us to drive the growth of that entire economic sector. It is, it is worth saying, worth repeating, that, and I'll come. I'll talk more about this in a session in a second. But that economic new frontier, cis lunar space, is going to be for strategic reasons, and certainly for strategic reasons, and for for commerce also, for economic reasons, is by far the most important new frontier 
and the nation who controls that will control probably the rest of the decade. It's kind of a big deal. Our, our friends in, um, I, I spent a lot of time at headquarters of the chief technologist working with the chief scientists of NRO and the, the, our Intel folks and the chief scientists over at Space Force. They are, panic may be too strong a word, but they are absolutely terrified about what the Chinese are doing. And there's a lot that they can't do because of the way our treaties are written and space treaties and so on. And they need NASA to be that first move to kind of establish that U.S. leadership in a, you know, a collaborative and non-threatening way. We absolutely need to be successful in doing that. So we need to understand what all that the entire um, industry needs and then to, to develop that, make sure we're developing the right capabilities to address that. I'll come back to this in a minute. We're, what, at the end, I'll tell you what we're actually, how we're going to implement that. Question, yes, sir. I just have a question because you talked about Space Force. And back when I came to JSC back in the age, uh, uh, Larry Griffin was the DOD uh, lead on the ninth floor. And when Hoffman uh, came in as Air Force guy, but he talked about protecting the sovereignty of space. And it's getting more and more involved now because there's more and more people throwing stuff into space. Yeah. Is, are you guys wrapped up into what does sovereignty of space mean? Yeah. In, in fact, I didn't spend much time on it, but one of those tenants that, that Pam um, created at headquarters about what, you know, the tenants for our moon to Mars is exactly about that, about ensuring the, uh, the sovereignty and the freedom of access and that kind of stuff. Because, um, I, I mean, this is probably not the right forum, but I think you all are, everybody in this room is very aware that space is, for our purposes, it's, it's, it's for exploration and, and expanding human presence and all that. But it is, is strategically, it is the most contested environment, the most, the hottest environment right now. I, I, like I said, I spent a lot of time in Space Force. You know, there was a lot of noise being made before the election about what's this Space Force nonsense and a lot of chatter, all the political chatter around it. And then a new administration showed up and they immediately doubled down on it and increased the funding. Nobody thinks it's a joke. Everybody understands what the threat is and, and that we need to be, we need to be preeminent. Um, so let me show you a little bit. I said we got some folks to come in and, and, and look at this. Um, I want to show you so, just a few charts. I won't bore you too much with this, but just to give you a sense of, um, you know, how the picture is changing. And none of this is a negative, by the way. It's just different, right? Like I said, the dimensions of the problem are growing. Um, what used to be a purely technical race is, is very much a geopolitical Thing and it's and it's growing rapidly. So this is just a shot, a snapshot, a couple of years old actually. The space economy today, not 10 years from now, today is actually 400 billion dollars. And by, they include in that like things like GPS and the offboard driving stuff and the uh, precision agriculture and all that. But the, the value of this business is 400 billion dollars today. The part in the in the brownish, orangish, whatever there is, what the global government investment is by all nations. It's less than 25% of that pie. It's kind of interesting, right? Most of us think of this as a, at least used to be a US versus, now it's a government you know, partnership. No, it's core of the business. The little wedge on the side is the US government. And of that 25 million is NASA. So just put that in perspective. In 1970, we controlled, we, we JSC almost controlled most of it actually, but we controlled something like 60 or 70% of the entire nation, world's global budget in spaceflight. Today, we control 25 billion out of 400 billion. That's 6% of that marketplace. So when you say you want to be a leader and you're in a hub, pretty easy to do when you've got a big stick and you're 70%. Right? Different game when you're 6% of a market. But but we are the hub and we are the leader for the human space flight part of this. Um, the growth in the private sector is probably the biggest thing that's, that's amazing, right? So that government pie is staying pretty constant. We have good support, continue to have good support from both parties, no problem. But the private sector is going crazy. $26 billion since 2000. Um, there's all these new investment um, instruments coming out now. In fact, our homegrown intuitive machine just got a offer for almost a billion dollars to buy a company that didn't exist a few years ago. Um, that, was, that was all that capital is coming out of what's called a SPAC deal. It's, I don't even understand it. It's all raised out as cryptocurrency and all this crazy stuff. There's, there's all kinds of creative um, ways that private sector money is flowing into this business because it's seen as a huge growth opportunity. And then there's tons of countries and obviously the, the, the private billionaires going into it. Um, this is about this is about satellite launches per year. And again, I'm just trying to show you how exponentially these trends are, right? So 
for most of our careers, there's been something on the order of under certainly under a couple hundred launches a year, all all vehicles, not not obviously not human vehicles, but all all space launches, orbital launches. That's been consistent for a couple of decades. So last, what is this? 2020, there were a thousand. 21, there was 1,200. This year, there's supposed to be 12,000 vehicles put into orbit. So from 200 to 1,200 to 12,000, and that that's pretty much what exponential is, right? Um, that's really important to, 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 to recognize when today SpaceX just launched um, um, a communication satellite. Actually, it's a, it's a, it's a what do you call it? A constellation of 60 something um, for a private, for a European group. That was the 50th launch of SpaceX this year in, in 10 months, 50 launches. That's, that's, that's five a month. It's more than one a week. Think about that for a minute. That's different. That's a different game than we are used to. Um, the other thing that I, 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 so I have to mention is, and there's things that are changing in the game, like not incrementally, but actually like profound exponential changes that they're gonna you know, reuse of the cost for one thing. If you talk about reusable launch vehicles, um, small sats are in, in, in certainly in the intelligence world and the science world are taking, we talked about institute, you know, using the resources there so that you can have longer, longer missions without carrying all that stuff on orbit servicing um and then there's all this 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 advanced materials and and advanced manufacturing that's revolutionizing and, and these are not theoretical things if you go look at how they're building things down at boca chica at spacex they're using all these advanced materials they're using all this additive manufacturing they build those engines they're building like I, I can't i can't even say this without laughing they're building two raptor engines a day using an additive manufacturing that's insane that that's just I never thought I would see that, you know, and they're, they're not, they're not a joke. They're a full, that is a full flow cycle. That is the most complex cycle you can imagine. And they're building, like they're just cranking them out. I mean, there's 30 something up on each, each stage. And so they got to have a built a bunch of them, but they're not playing. And then there's this machine intelligence thing, which we don't have time to talk about, but that's going to change the game everywhere. So we went out and looked at that marketplace. And um, like I said, you know, what, what is the full breadth of what we need to be focused on? The bullseye is intended to be a cartoon that says, look, our focus is NASA, right? We are about NASA's missions and human exploration. But we know right outside of that is our international partnership. And we are absolutely responsible for, for growing the U.S. influence as we see all these companies, these new countries, South Korea, Brazil, they're all India, they're all coming into the space game, right? We don't want them drifting to the wrong place. We want them in the, in the fold. We want them, and that is what the administration expects us to do. That's what is the intelligence and and DOD community expects us to be the one that embraces those guys. And so they're on, on this side of the fence. And then there's the, the industry, private sector stuff, all the new, new startups, et cetera, et cetera. We want to be make sure we're, we're not just watching or supporting, but actually being a catalyst to the growth of that, because that's where the economic growth is going to come from. The 400 billion is expected to grow to, grow to several trillion in a decade. And the Chinese have a 100 year plan that includes dominating the economic growth in space. I, I got a briefing on that from our friends across the river and they're dead serious. Everything you've seen them do recently with the space station landing on the far side, all that stuff, it's literally in a 100 year plan and they've hit every single milestone. And that plan ends with them dominating economically and strategically that high ground and they're not playing. And um, if, like I said, I spent a lot of my time in the DOD world and skunk works and so on, you know, those are old enough to remember there was a nuclear um, threat with Iraq about, I don't know, 1980, 81, whatever. And we launched a strike with the Israelis where we put a bunch of F-16, a couple flights of F-16s up. We, I mean, it, it was a big operation, right? Tankers, you know, several several wings of F-16s. First ones had some um, armor piercings, brown or uh, weapons, and they, they punched a hole in the reactor core and they, or in the containment vest on them. We had some precision guide weapons, GB-48 or whatever went in. Took it out. That was a uh, incredibly expensive, incredibly risky, incredible um, risk of life. And and then what? A couple of years ago, the Iranians tried the same thing. And what do you know? Magically, their centrifuges just spin out of control and blow up their own reactor. Nobody launched it. Nobody fueled an airplane. What well, you know? Nobody launched anything. Nobody dropped a bomb. It's gone. That is all done from space by cyber interaction. So. Don't misunderstand how powerful and how important that is. The next war is who, he who controls that ground controls controls everything, including, by the way, our water supply and our emergency call services and everything else. 
which it, we have treaties that say we won't do that, but that hasn't proven very true in the past. <laughs> um, so we looked at that whole that whole you know uh, spectrum of so what are these customers? And we're talking of every part of that as a potential customer. What does NASA and JSC need to do to enable U.S. success in all that entire domain? And we heard a bunch. We interviewed people directly. We interviewed, did a lot of formal stuff, um, one-on-ones with both our internal stakeholders and all these private sector folks, um, Elon's people and Bezos and everybody else. Um, and we kind of heard a couple of things, which not surprising. Um, the one on the right, they want, they need the capabilities. There's a bunch of great capabilities that we have inside NASA have been developed over the years. If we can make it available to them in a timely way, it's not even a cost issue, it's a time issue because of the time to market. They want to take advantage of that. They really want to. We got to figure out how to do the thing on the lower left though, that is to be business friendly, operate at the speed of business and have, you know, real pricing and stuff that these guys are serious. I went out to Midland, Texas recently. They are building it as a company called AST. So you're probably familiar with Starlink. Elon's putting up 12,000 um, spacecraft that he's going to, you know, that that revolutionized internet connectivity everywhere. There's a similar company, but they're they're dealing with 5, 5G cell phone service globally. So they're putting 200, 300 and something vehicles on orbit and at 250 nautical miles, kind of interesting altitude. Um, and they're going to do that in the next couple of years, launching all on Starship out of Boca Chica, by the way. They've already contracted those launches. They will dominate the, the when you take when you open, when you get your phone from now on, you know when you see that little thing that says ATT on mine or Verizon? All it'll say is roaming. And you won't realize this, but ATT and Verizon have now contracted with those guys to do it all by satellite instead of cell towers. So they're gonna dominate that. The point of that is I went out and visited them and I was shocked because they have built the most amazing in Midland, Texas, they have built the most amazing vibe, acoustic. Um, altitude facilities you ever want to see in your life. These spacecraft, they're kind of origami like this, like the web telescope, because to reach us, you know, to reach this antenna, you gotta have a pretty good aperture. They've unfolded to two tennis courts. They're huge, they're insane. That's why they have to go on the, the SpaceX um, vehicle. It's the only thing that you can't have a fairing big enough, even what, hold it up. What's the name of that company? AST. Never heard of it, right? I never heard it either. I went out there as a, a courtesy to a friend. I'm like, Midland, my folks are about there. I'll go, whatever. Well, how can, you know, what, what, good folks in Midland. I was shocked. But what they told me was they wanted to use JSC facilities, but if they don't get those satellites on orbit next year, then some guy in Silicon Valley is going to kill them to that market. So even though it's cost, it's not that the, the, it's capital intensive, the non-recurring cost, the cost is not their problem. They got it. No matter what the cost, they got to get there first. And they don't have time to deal with our space act agreements and all the nonsense. So it, it's an interesting dynamic that it's not, people will actually build stuff that is not, Economically, seems like a good idea, but you've got to get to market because things are moving so fast. So we heard, we heard a lot about that, but the thing on the left, I want to say, we heard for sure, the one thing they said is, nobody else but NASA can provide the strategic framework for this, you know, what's going to be this incredibly um, expanding um, um, business. And by that, they mean, there are people, obviously we expected to hear that from folks who want to be a supplier to NASA that they need us to lay out the framework and a strategy that they can kind of build a business case. But what we were surprised is that the guys who want to do space tourism and mining and whatever crazy thing, you know, um, that whatever else people think of that they think they can make a buck at, they can't build a business case and get investments unless they understand what the stable long-term structure of this, you know, thing is. And only NASA can do that. Only the government can lay out the standards and say, so, yes, sir. Only NASA can do that. How are the Chinese going to well, that's a really great question, right? So um, the Chinese, um, I don't know if I said this already, but did I tell you, I, I just, I gave a talk in South Korea just recently. Did I tell you this? I just gave a, so the Chinese are contesting us in that role. It's definitely, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's, you know, typically we'd think it's the Russian, it's the Chinese. So I gave a talk in South Korea. Um, and you guys old enough to remember, you know, they're a pretty good ally, right? They're a pretty solid ally. I gave this talk about Artemis and how we want everybody to be part of the team and want to be on our team, blah, blah, blah. And in, so in Seoul, South Korea, which is a you know, solid, reliable US ally, that, that you know what I got from the press? They all stood up and said, why would we invest with you when we've got a neighbor to the north that's willing to pour cash into us and, and collaborate on technology and join their, you know, they've, they've got all this, they bought all the Soviet technology, they can do whatever they want. And I thought that was interesting that they're courting South Korea which you would think would just not even be a possibility. So the answer is 
again, to back what I said originally, and I'm sorry if I'm making that strategic argument too much, but I know this is a, this is a room of adults. We could talk about this stuff, right? Um, it's really important that we, we, we lead that game. It's really, really, really important. Uh, we also, so, so I say, okay, that's, these are kind of the things that we need to provide. We said, what is a, we, we, we did a bunch of brainstorming senior staff and, and consultants and so on and said, what are the future states? What characteristics do we need to develop? If you recall, the first thing I showed, you know, said, hey, we need to be hardcore systems engineer for an integrated monolithic system. Then we got to figure out in a space station, how do we develop international partnerships? There are new capabilities and characteristics in that community got to develop. These are kind of meant to be a list of what are the kind of things we really need to focus on. And that, you know, certainly the, the technical stuff of being that leader in, in coordinating the architecture and, and coordinating the international community, um, integrating the exploration architecture and plans and strategy. Certainly those are things we need to take ownership of um, for the United States and its allies, right? And providing the core capabilities that support that. But that long-term strategic plan that people can build their, their, their business plans around the investment, that we have a strategic plan internally and that we can share with the community that we're building the capabilities to support the kinds of work that we need to do to be successful. And then that the one on customer focus. So I'll just take, take that for a minute and I won't read through all of them, but a lot of work went into that. And you can imagine there's tons of words behind all that, but it's actually a pretty good thoughtful set of, if I didn't know anything else and I just looked at the market and asked people what they wanted, what would we need to be? Not surprising, a lot of things are, these are things we're good at, a lot of them, right? So we took these and we mapped them back into those five big core themes that Mark had started the team out on and they map really well. And then we're often making plans to go, hey, how do we, all right, so I'm gonna lead globally. I gotta be the leader. I gotta be the expert technically. I've gotta be the innovator. That's, you know, it, it can't be that I continue to, I'll be careful how I say this, but if other guys are returning first stages and second stages and we aren't showing the world that we're leading, that's, that's a problem. That's a problem. Um, and we got to be that we have to be actually developing stuff here and be a catalyst for that economic growth. So we've, what we've done is mapped all these future states, as we call them, which are nothing, nothing more than saying what is kind of the acumen and the, the culture and capabilities we need to develop at JSC to be responsive to that evolving market. And in these five areas, um, you know, so so if you kind of think of this from strategy down, we're here to accelerate human exploration for the benefit of humanity. That's big long phrase but it actually two things in there one is we're accelerating and that word we chose it deliberately because there are certain things we are going to own and there are certain things that we are going to help other people do well at so that the country can continue to dominate economically and strategically so we will like, we'll help to be the catalyst in some cases in some cases we will, we will be running our programs the goal would be that if we are successful we should be kind of at the leading edge and we should be helping other people fill in behind us, right? The commercial world, just like they did in aviation. You know, like I said, aviation and ACA put a lot of money into airfoil technology and skin friction drag and winglets and everything else. And aviation in the last century, and so did governments around the world. Aviation is $7 trillion concern today globally. It's doing just fine by itself. And that's great. That's a win. So we're not we're not business a little bit doing supersonic overflying flight doing distributed propulsion to help them kind of crack those things that'll keep us us in the lead but we want no lower to orbit we're starting to turn a lot of that over to the commercial and you can imagine that line keep continuing to move nasa's got to be at the front of pushing that bleeding edge right um and we, we, when we talk about our strategy of dare united explore we're talking about in terms of what are the, the key acumens that we have under these these um five kind of themes that we're talking about what we're doing today is we're now in the process of for all these you know millions of um things i showed you here and there are quite a few there's a few more of them actually we are actually building kind of a project plan for how to get from where i am and in some cases i'm pretty close i mean there's some things like our technical capabilities that we're 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 we're, we're getting pretty close but we might have to tweak things a bit and there's other things like how do we build public private partnerships how do we build um, you know, dual use facilities and stuff where our, some of our international folks can, have, who the, the government wants us to embrace some of these, these emerging com countries. Well, we can't get them on site. You know, how are we going to do that? that? There's some things we have to figure out how to do. We're actually going to build kind of a project plan for each of those. I'm, so I'm in charge of processing the products. Um, Donna, Donna Schaefer is in charge of how we're going to build out our facilities plan. And Steve Kerner is in charge of how we're going to 
trying, you know, how are we going to build a workforce, the right skill set to do all this? And we literally are going to have a senior retreat on December 6th. And the goal is to come out of there with, you know, it won't be perfect, obviously, but it'll be a first pass of kind of literally like a Gantt chart of how do I get from here to there and what are the milestones and we're going to assign each of the senior staff to be champions and treat it like a project so that we actually just don't talk about it, but we actually make, make progress. Um, and then I've got a, several charts on, on each of those five, but I won't, I won't take you through all that. What's the cooperation level in the center? You know, that's a really great question because I got to be honest with you. When I left five years ago, I know there were, you know, there were people, there are a lot of people kind of singing this stuff and a lot of people were just like, I've, Flavor of the month, right? You know. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the, the question is, what's the level of cooperation among the center and the center leadership and stuff? I am absolutely encouraged by the. You know, we've had a we have pretty much a new crop of folks. I mean, a lot. It's funny. I get back to senior staff and I'm like, hey, I, I remember you. You know, we used to live together, and it, it's it's nice, right? Because it, it's it's guys you know and you can be honest with. And I think they'd be honest with me if they thought it was crap. I think they'd be honest. Vanessa has been quite honestly, just a, a breath of fresh air, her, her ability to work with the, you know, a lot of what I'm going to say here, we're, we can do, but a lot of it, we need the state, certainly the, the, you know, Houston, Greater Houston Partnership, BAHEP, the state of Texas has got to be, got our back, right? I, I mean, you know, our, our Cornyn, um, Ted Cruz, they've got to have our back on this. So, you know, we, there's some of this we cannot do by ourselves. And Vanessa has been an absolute powerhouse going out there and I thought my coach was pretty good at shaking hands and kissing babies. But Vanessa has been amazing in the community. And that's, that's a big, that's been a big help for us. So we're getting a lot of positive feedback, but to the question, I think she's got the, the confidence of the senior staff and I, Hey, you guys know, right. It says when you start hand waving about this kind of crap, I mean, I'm an engineer at heart. A lot, you know, your typical flight director is going to go, man, I don't, I don't know what that is. You know, I mean, you're, you're talking a lot of words there, but let me go back to flying my spacecraft. But I think folks understand that it's a natural transition, as I said. If you kind of think of those three blocks that I laid out, right? We're just, the problem's getting a little more complex and we're going to step up to it. Yes, sir. Do you think NASA and JSC as it stands now is structured to do this? No, sir. I do not. What do you envision for reorganization? Yeah, so we're we're already starting some of that, and that, that that workforce team that I mentioned that Steve's leading is literally going to lay out a transformation plan that we're going to start in January. Because you've lost a lot of the experienced people. Yes, sir. Really Most of them are sitting. Yes, sir. <laughs> and from the new population we've seen, it doesn't seem that they're capable of doing this. They haven't got the background experience. Yeah, it's, it, let me come back to that in a second because my battery's about to quit on me. So let me just do one more slide and I'll come back to that because I think that's a really good point. I just want to, just before this thing dies on me, let me make the point that what we're talking about doing is building, when we say the hub of human space flight, we, we'll coin this phrase, I don't know if it's great, but you know, we have an energy corridor. We want to talk about a space corridor. And we're starting with, there's all this innovation stuff, all this energy downtown for, in, in Houston with the ION and the and, um mass challenge and i mean there's just a bunch of stuff so we're, we're partnered with those guys with rice and university of houston we got a university consortium i'll talk about in a minute um all the way down to the spaceport and us oh what happened there there we go thank you all the way down to to you know the spaceport and what we're going to build out here which i'll talk about in a minute but the idea is when i say we're the hub the spokes are kind of on the right and beyond all across the, the country. We want everybody to recognize that this is where the action is. And this is where you're going to be in the human space flight business that you need to come here. The, I mentioned the mass challenge and, and the Canon and, and, and the post and all these that were, you know, that's kind of part of the innovation ecosystem that Houston's driving and they're doing a very good job with their 10 year plan. So we're participating in that, including them in it, in that, as well as the Houston space Port. Um, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but you know, a few years ago we, we were talking this up, and now we've got Axiom, Intuitive Machines, Collins, um, Venus. We've got real companies out there doing real business. They can't hire, they can't find people to hire. Like it's crazy. There are gonna be more people out here than at JSC pretty soon. Self's doubling his workforce in the next few months. Um, Ultimate's doing the same. Um, they're doing well, they're doing really well. So we're starting to see. The analog that I, I think is useful to keep in mind um, is, is what they've done at Kennedy. So, so let me say there's some other things we're working on. 
So that kind of, if you think about the past challenge in academia, sort of the basic research and, and innovation, incubation kind of stuff, we've got the piece at the space, at the spaceport, which is more like an industrial park where new companies come and build stuff and actually, you know, whether they're surfacing NASA or, or our private sector interest. But then there's another other compliments we need. We are working right now, we've announced uh, um, availability of land to get a private developer to come in, private public-private partnership. The state's very interested in, in participating in this as an economic development activity. Develop a research park just outside the gate, over the Longhorn Park area, where we will see the blue origin and the SpaceX. They're, they're being down our door asking us, how can we you know, locate here? And there's all kinds of problems with getting the space on site, but we should have a research park right outside. And we're, we're working on that. Very great interest from Dr. Bond and then the state legislature in supporting that. A lunar Mars simulation facility in partnership with Space Center Houston across the road, which would be, um, just to give you an idea, this is a simulation facility that each of those is the size of like three football fields where we have, you know, the, the, the uh, regular simulation, the lighting conditions, uh, gravity offload, the whole thing. And it would, the intent, again, in all of these, the intent is NASA is going to be a customer there, but all these other guys don't have to build 10 versions of this around the country. This is where they'd come and we could, we could kind of amortize those resources, right? And help each other out. And as I said, we've got the university consortium. We've got, I think, the best universities in the country. Um, Texas A&M, our very own former Dr. Robert Ambrose out of uh, ER is actually leading that consortium and, and they're participating and, and kind of bringing that academic piece of it as well, both from a research and development point of view, but also from a workforce development standpoint. Because our biggest, right now, we are exhausting the pipeline. We are we're kind of capitalizing each other in this region, and that's a, that's that's our one of our biggest concerns. If we're successful, and I know we will be, we've got to be very careful. Um, so, the, maybe one way to paint this vision is when I say the hub of human spaceflight. If when up to five years ago, if you drove down to Kennedy, and we've all, you, if you remember, you go over the bridge, you see that they had that electronic marquee says Kennedy Space Center or whatever. And, you know, you'd see the DAB and you'd see that launch pad 39A, blah, blah, blah. And Bob and Janet kind of went on a, a thought process like this a few years ago, uh, Cabana and, and Janet Petro, and said, hey, world's changing, shuttle shut down, you know, we kind of run out of work, tidal spills drying up, Why are we gonna, how are we going to make this work? And they actively went out and said, we want to be America's spaceport. And what do you know? You know, SpaceX just launched their, I think of the 50 launches, I think 48 of them are from Canaveral, right? Um, and you got Blue Origin, you got Boeing, you got Lockheed, 